Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar called Game Birds of Missouri. Uh, my name is Dana. I'm the co-director and co-founder of the Missouri River Bird Observatory. And this is, um, I think, our 16th webinar um, as an organization during the, the pandemic that we're all currently experiencing. But tonight, we are lucky enough to have some partners with us to share their expertise. Oops. So here are the folks that are going to be presenting to you this evening, um, Ethan Duke and Zeb Yoko. Ethan is the other co-founder and co-director of the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, and Zeb Yoko, our conservation science communicator. Uh, MRBO is dedicated to the conservation of Missouri's birds and other wildlife through research and monitoring, education and outreach, and uh, conservation policy advocacy. We also have, I'm excited to say, we have Ethan Kleekamp from Pheasants Forever Quail Forever. Um, PFQF is known as the Habitat Organization, and they have more than 20 chapters here in Missouri and about 4,000 members in our state alone. Um, and he's going to talk to you quite a lot about PFQF's um, really good habitat restoration work um, for pheasants and quail. And then we have Tyler Cooper of the National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, one of NWTF's taglines is save the habitat, save the hunt. So you're going to be hearing about um, habitat restoration and management for our wild turkey populations as well. Um, I just want to say as um, an organization, MRBO, that works a little bit on game birds in terms of surveying for them, um, we as an organization do not actually do, we don't own land, um, we don't engage in habitat restoration and management, but throughout the course of our research and monitoring projects, we have seen how the really good work of PFQF and National Wild Turkey Federation have put thousands of acres of habitat on the ground that benefits not just um, the specific species that their organizations are named for, but also so many other species of birds and other wildlife as well. So um, we're thankful to have them here tonight and thankful that their organizations are here in our state. Um, so just what to expect this evening. Here's the outline of our, of our night. Um, Ethan Duke of MRBO is going to talk about ducks and geese. Um, Tyler's going to talk about wild turkey, of course. Um, Zeb's going to get on and talk about a variety of different um, game birds, particularly upland game birds. Um, Ethan Kleekamp is, of course, going to talk about quail and pheasant. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for question and answers from you all. Um, a couple things about Zoom technology. I know we have a number of people on here that we've had before, but I, there was a bunch of names I didn't recognize. And so just to briefly go over the Zoom tech, um, you should see probably at the bottom of your screen, although depending on your device, it might be elsewhere. Um, you have a chat function, a raise hand function, and a Q&A. Um, so your chat will go directly to us, the panelists. Um, feel free to use that, particularly if you have, if you're having some kind of technical difficulty or something like that. Um, our presenters may or may not ask you to raise your hand and answer to a question. Um, otherwise, we probably won't be using that that much. And then, of course, the Q&A, you can put any questions that you have there in the Q&A box and we'll we'll address all questions at the end. So, but if you, you know, are listening towards the beginning and you don't want to forget your question, go ahead and put it in whenever you want to. And that's it. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Ethan Duke. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Uh, I'm going to bring up my presentation here. Almost left the meeting by accident. That wouldn't have been good. <laughs> he gets. Well, um, so my, my topic was to talk about ducks, geese, and uh, coots, basically the, the waterfowl that, that is our game birds in Missouri. And one, as one of the background in um, waterfowl ecology, I was like a little like, oh man, how am I going to fit my little segment in 10 minutes and talk about them all? So I'm just going to sort of gloss over them and talk about these game birds and sort of uh, some neat facts about them and, and what they mean. Um, I always think of these things as ducks, geese, and swans. That's how we're classically trained. Um, 
but uh, we're not covering swans because they're not hunted in Missouri. I don't know where they are, but we'll cover coots because they are. So uh, this is a beautiful photograph by Eric Willett, one of our photo contest entries there. Um, that's a Missouri scene right there. It plays out on the, on the landscape in Missouri. And those are some beautiful swans, so they get their moment of glory for this presentation. There's me a few years ago. Um, and, and I thought about this presentation quite a bit because game birds have meant a lot to me my whole life. Um, that bird was about half my weight probably back then. But that's sort of how I grew up. And I always thought of them as, as food first. Um, and then later on in my life, I, I learned a lot of philosophy of life through learning about pursuit. There's so many lessons that are learned by just being in the outdoors and being on the hunt. And I, I learned a lot about nature that way. And it sort of opened up a door and one day it dawned on me um, that all these things that I've learned to appreciate, I could probably actually find a career in. And so that's what I did. And then later in life, um, I still can find time every now and then to enjoy hunting. This is uh, Dana and I down in uh, Louisiana last year on a duck hunt and, and fishing trip. And that was absolutely wonderful where I learned a ton about conservation thanks to those wonderful people down in Southern Louisiana. Um, it, was, it was really neat. And, uh, and now we continue the pursuit. Um, so, Here's a, here's a few birds that you can pursue uh, if you're into the wetland habitat hunting. And we'll start with ducks. And if you think about ducks and you think about managing for ducks, um, they fit in those main two groups, dabblers and divers. Um, I sort of want to say there's some in between, but even the divers that are in our game bird groups, they don't really dive that deeply. You know, they say they're a diver if they dive more than 13 inches. But most of the divers I'm going to go over only dive about, you know, maybe two meters at most. And a lot of them just dive straight down and then pop right back up again. But they all have a lot of diversity with it, within these groups, whether they're divers or dabblers, uh, to, to maximize their foraging. And they have a lot of difference in range. So let's just take a look at a couple of these bird groups and look at dabblers. So we have mallards, blue winged teal, greening teal, that little segment of dabblers and then we have these divers and the here's a beautiful picture of our, our classic dabbler the green head everybody knows looks like daffy the duck there um so this is the drake the male um and he's got uh, that great bill designed to, for foraging um dabbling around and sifting things through the lamellae on his bill um those other birds that are in this group are quite a few american black duck mottled duck um very similar to uh, the mallard, um, different range, different habitat preferences. So you can think of the black duck as more of a, a, a flooded forest bird. Uh, blue winged teal, a lot like uh, mallards. Um, different ranges though, different timing. Those, those teal in particular have a much different uh, uh, timing strategy. That's why they have a early teal season for them. Um, but you can see they're all also very beautiful, very colorful. Uh, fascinating birds. Most of these birds are highly, highly migratory. Uh, wood duck, as you know, is a, a Missouri resident and doesn't quite migrate as far. Um, here's a good pot of wood ducks hanging out in Missouri. This is a, a common sight in Missouri, especially if there's good timber around, uh, lots of acorns and things. You'll, you'll find these in our wetlands. And here's an animated range map. I'm not sure exactly how well it will work on Zoom, but you can see over time those birds concentrate um, all throughout North America. And then in the winter time, you can see they just go down in the Southern US. That's, that's the wood ducks migration. And then juxtapose that to maybe the blue winged teal. And you'll see that they come through here really early, then they go quite a ways up North and they concentrate up in the Northern prairies up there. Then they early come back down again. So there's a lot of these shifting dynamics going on with all these waterfowl species overlapping. And so, I'll look at some of these divers really quick. Look at the difference in that bill right there though for, for this particular bird. And, and these redheads, you know, they, they've got these things on their tongue. They're designed to be able to root down around and grab some things, not just totally filter feed uh, like a lot of our dabblers do. So among them, we have these amazing birds like these greater and lesser scalp that come through that migrate all the way up to the high Arctic. Um, but a large swath of the high Arctic. And they have different strategies, uh, slightly different foods that they prefer. 
Um, that lesser scalp probably dives a little bit deeper and spends a little bit more time underwater. So they all need these different food groups and things throughout their full life cycle as they're coming through Missouri. Even the ring duck duck looks very similar, but a little bit different foraging as well. Our hooded mergansers, which is a Missouri uh, resident as well, just like the wood duck, you could put up nest boxes for these birds. Um, they migrate through as well. But um, you'll see them diving and staying underwater quite a bit more, and they actually go horizontal under the water. They don't pop up in the same spot. Um, beautiful, neat, unique bird. And then you have redheads and canvasbacks, and they're, they're pretty remarkable as well. Um, very interesting strategies. Uh, all these birds you can see, I guess I, I skipped a major part of their anatomy. I want to jump back to real quick. Look at these dabblers and look how their feet are positioned directly underneath them. That's another way you can tell it's a dabbler because those diving, they can walk around on the uplands and get around just fine. Most of these um, divers, their legs are positioned more on the back, towards the back of their body. And so they're more designed for swimming. So those are our ducks um, and the dabblers and the divers. Then we get into our goose species. And here's a beautiful, what we call light goose here, a snow goose. Not at all to be confused with this goose, which is the Ross's goose. And it's a smaller version of the snow goose. Another far northern migrant, migrates through Missouri in great numbers. Um, just a very, it's a great spectacle of, of a site. Um, these, their numbers have gone up quite a bit because they're able to forage and take advantage on their winter grounds of agricultural products and byproducts of just uh, waste grains and, and other things. And um, their population, since they have such a good winter survival, they've been finding that they've been eating themselves out of house and home on their breeding grounds. So that's another a reason why there's such high bag limits on these birds is trying to preserve their habitat because they, we've altered their, their success so much. Um, that's the Ross's goose, that little one down there. This little Ross's goose, look how far it goes up north, like way up and, and not quite widespread in the high Arctic, but they actually go way up north of the Hudson Bay in the very central part of the Arctic up there, the North Americans bit of it at least. And um, they were the last um, uh, light goose to ever be discovered and the last one is to be discovered nesting um, because they're just so remote uh, and such a, it's just a different world, but they, they share our world with us for at least part of the year. So those are the, the light geese. And then people talk about Canada geese and, and uh, cackling geese and they call them brant, but it's not to be confused with the species brant. These are brant geese. This is uh, Labranta hutchinsoni and our uh, hutchinsoni. And they are smaller than a Canada goose. And you're, if you're lucky, you'll pick them out. You'll see them in a flock of Canada's. Um, and, and they also sound differently. I'm gonna go turn on my sound here and uh, make sure you can hear this okay. This is, so you're familiar with the Hong Kong of the, the Canada, but here's the cackling. So then there's this bird that looks like some sort of barn goose, which is the greater white fronted goose. And then there's this bird here. So this goose, if anybody might know what it is, that's actually a snow goose. But it just happens to be that they come in two phases. They have a, a blue phase, a dark phase as well. Um, so that covers the geese, ducks and geese. And then I'll jump right into the coots. And I can see a couple coots, and this is how we often see them. And we see many coots every year in Missouri. And here they are um, hanging out with some ducks. You know, a gadwall will um, follow these coots around sometimes and wait for the coots to go down and stir up some vegetation and they'll steal food from them. Um, but because they don't, they just tip up to feed. They don't go down quite as far as these little coots do. What's remarkable about them is not only the neat face shield that they often have in the front there, that's usually very visible, is also the lobed feet. That's a great adaptation they have for moving around in the marshes. So um, 
that they're a unique thing. They're a little bit clumsy. Um, uh, there's a few of us in Missouri that volunteer to do um, uh, window strike surveys in, in some of our areas in Missouri, like Kansas City. And uh, one day Dana was on 12th and Main Street in the morning and uh, she found this guy, downtown Kansas City. So they're migrating at night. They see some flat surface down there. They get confused by the lights and they go to land. And this is a pretty common occurrence, landing on roads and things. And it's, they have to really get running to take off too. So uh, it, it's just one of the perils of, of, of being a coot. Uh, but it's, it's another one of those game birds of Missouri. I have no idea how they taste, but um, that's the coot. So that, that is, is my introductory segment. Um, I would love to talk more about habitat management for these birds, um, but there's just so much to cover for all the different species. Basically, Missouri has lost 85% of its wetlands. Thanks to organizations like Ducks Unlimited, um, they've, they've been able to make big progress in putting some wetlands back on the landscape and enhancing others. Also the USDA NRCS, who often works in hand in hand with the Missouri Department of Conservation with their dual positioned uh, wetland emphasis teams, they're doing a remarkable job as well. So we've been documenting that for years now. And uh, if you have any questions about that, shoot me a line and I'd be happy to answer them. And stop the share and, and hand it over to, uh, to Zeb now. And uh, no, to, okay, Ethan's pointing to Tyler. So it's Tyler. Yes. So I'll All right. So okay. Just up here. All right. All right. Does that look good to everybody? Good. So my name is Tyler Cooper. I'm a, a forester for the National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, I'm up in the northwest portion of Missouri, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit just about basic identification of the turkey, um, what goes into their habitat, and a little bit of what we can do to make it better because they're in decline and it's been going downhill for about the last 20 years and the last 10 years significantly. So we'll just start here. Um, so basic identification, the toms and jakes are males. Jakes are juveniles, so they're the first year Good way to tell them the difference is that full fan. A tom will always have a full fan and, a, and typically a long beard. And Jake's will have that broken up fan. They'll have a short stubby little beard. And if you can see on the legs in these two pictures, the birds on the left hand side, the one, the tom, the adult has spurs. And then the one on the middle, the Jake has just nubs for spurs. So that's kind of, and also the male birds typically have red on their heads, red and white. The bird on the right is a hen. Um, typically, easy way to identify them is they're not as dark black as the toms are. They have a blue head and the feathers kind of go all the way up the neck, almost to the top of their head there, which this picture kind of shows all that. They also don't have spurs. And 90% of the time they don't have beards, but they can. So it's not super rare and impossible to see a, a bearded hen. Um, they weigh, typically, hens will be around 15 pounds, and toms can get all the way up to 25 pounds. So there's four subspecies of turkeys. Um, the one in Missouri is the eastern. In Florida, they have an Osceola, and then a Rio Grande, which is typically found from Nebraska all the way down to Texas, and then a Merriam's, which is kind of a mountain turkey. So that's the four subspecies, and like I said, here in Missouri, we have the eastern, which is also the biggest. So. Um, a little bit about our se hunting season here in Missouri. We have two seasons. We have an April, which is our spring season. It's always the third week in April. And then we have a, a four month season in the fall. And it's from September 15th to January 15th. But most people prefer the spring season because birds are gobbling. And the, the reason that is, is because the daylight starts to get longer in the spring and the hens, once they have the proper amount of nutritional status, they are receptive to those toms. So that's kind of how we set our seasons on that third Monday of April. Um, that's how it's always been. And it's it's typically pretty good. Um, it, it's actually 
greater in southern Missouri, but it still pans out pretty good across the state. So, and like I said, that nutritional status is really what drives the receptiveness of the hens that really makes them want to breed. So, um, now the nesting part. So a hen, obviously turkeys are ground nesting birds and they'll raise a clutch typically 10 to all the way up to they can have 20 eggs. And since they're ground nesting birds, they typically roost in trees overnight, but during the nesting season, the hens will sit on nests all night long. Um, and this is hard on them, one, just because they're ground nesting, and two, since they are on their nest majority of the time, it takes a lot of energy to develop these eggs and maintain them. <clears throat> they feed pretty rarely during the actual nesting portion, but they feed heavily prior to that, which is April and then March. Um, to get that protein for the egg production. So what, you know, what provides this food source early spring? I'll get to what provides the protein here in a second, but what really starts this spring is riparian areas, which typical turkey habitat requires mature timber for birds to roost in, and it will require um, some sort of water source. They can get water um, from Sorry, water. They can get moisture out of their plant material, but it's not as much as some other animals, such as mammals. I know they can get quite a bit. So that's what you're looking for if you're looking for good turkey habitat. You want to have some sort of mature timber and water, and then for brood rearing habitat, which is what we're about to get into, is going to be some thick cover. Um, so like I said, riparian areas, since they are typically moist, they are one of the first areas to green up. And then prescribed burned areas with that black soil, well, the black char on the soil, the temperature raises quicker. So they're again one of the first places to green up. So that's one of the first places you'll see turkeys in the hen or hens in the spring. And they kind of, turkeys are pretty cool because almost all winter long you won't see them hardly at all. And then spring comes around and they just, it's like they appear out of nowhere. And that's what they're doing is they're they're trying to find bugs and they're grubbing on this fresh um, herbaceous material. So, um, all right. Now that that's said, we're going to talk about the eggs. Like I said, they sit on the eggs or on their nest 28 days, so roughly a month. Typically, if a if a hen fails to nest, they will try a second time, and occasionally it's been noted for a third time, but typically two tries are what they give it. Um, so where do they get all this energy for the egg production and the time spent on the nest? And a lot of that is hard mass. So what, when I say hard mass, I mean nuts. Um, in Missouri, it's typically acorns. And uh, this next slide here, I'll show you, it's pretty interesting chart. So you can see in January, February, and March, which are your months leading up to nesting, that almost over 50% of their diet in those three months is acorns. So it's a big part. And I know a lot of people say up here in Northern Missouri, we don't have as many acorns, but we also don't have as big abundance of turkeys. So it, it, it really is a thing statewide. Excuse me. So on the management side on that acorn, so what can we do to have better production? Um, so the amount of precipitation we do or do not have has an effect on that, which we can't control. Um, early frost can hurt a heavy crop year on acorns. Again, we can't control that. But what we can control is if we do have oaks on our property, the canopy size and structure, we can alter for better production. So a TSI, which is called a timber stand improvement, is whenever you'll have an overstocked forest, so you'll thin it out targeting these oak species and other mass producing species, hickories and walnuts, but for turkeys typically it's gonna be oaks. And you'll pick good quality trees and release them. And what that means is just thin around them, get rid of the other species that are competing for sunlight and nutrients. And a, a big healthy tree is gonna put off more mast. So that's one of the good things we can do if we have the property. Um, Again, these are some different oaks that we have throughout Missouri. Burr oak and swamp white oak 
along with pin oak are kind of bottomland species and then white oak, black and red oak are kind of all over the board, but typically in your Ozark areas. So we talked about the foods needed to produce eggs, but what do we need for these hint or these pulps to make it? Um, and that's the biggest thing. In the past researches that we've done, the nest production has been anywhere from 70 to 100%, not successful as far as all of the eggs, but raising them. Um, the pulp productivity is where we have been declining in the last few years. And that, there's multiple reasons. Weather events will definitely affect that. Um, amount of predators will affect that. But the biggest thing, you know, those two things we really can't control. And the biggest thing that we can control is habitat. So what kind of habitat do we need? And um, this is what we're gonna go through. So these are all different types of habitat here that are just great for both, one, nesting. Um, thick cover is good for nesting just because it's a less chance of that bird being found. Um, but for broodering, you want it to be thick, but open, which doesn't make sense, but it will here in a little bit. So, and here in the top right corner, we have a, a group opening inside of a forest, or it could be a glade type setting. And it's full of natural herbaceous layer. It's got forbs, it's got native grasses, and even some re-sprouting trees. But this native stuff really creates an open ground layer underneath this thick thickness. And it also holds a lot of insects, which is what those little pulps need. The bottom right is a woodland, which most people are probably familiar with, but it's kind of the same principle. It can be controlled with um, controlled burns. And in certain scenarios, you can attempt to do it with mowing, but burning is the best option because that really stimulates the soil and gets those native species back, as well as it's got the canopy cover over top for roosting once the birds do get big enough to fly. Um, the bottom left is just a, a native prairie scene. Again, native grasses are, are wonderful because they got that open ground layer and they got a good top cover from avian species, avian predators, and then, excuse me, again, the bugs. So it's got a lot of food for them. And the top left might not be your ideal situation, but it, it's something that a lot of landowners could actually probably do. So you see a power line clearing and what looks like in this picture might be a food plot, but it's, there's still a good native herbaceous edge around there. It's not straight to the woods um, and it's not non-native fescue like that. So it's little things that we can do. That edge is a big thing um, that will benefit these pulps. So this is what it looks like whenever it's not ideal habitat. So wide open crop fields with no edges, um, a really overstocked closed canopy forest, which is the top left. You see sunlight doesn't really get to the ground there, so there's not much herbaceous layer on the ground floor. Um, overgrazed pasture, short ground, there's no cover, no protection. And then on the bottom right is a, it's an invasive species called bush honeysuckle that will outcompete anything in the understory and again creates no sunlight to get down to the forest floor and there's no herbaceous layer. So, um, and then I have here, as you can see, whenever you have basically poor habitat, poor cover, you're going to have poor results. Um, so a little bit more. Here's a better picture of what I was stating earlier about you have an open ground layer, but there's still cover. So on the right there, that's just a native prairie full of uh, native forbs and grasses. And then, like I said earlier, insects are what you're going to see in there. So um, here's another picture. It shows non-native on the right, native on the left. And this might be a little bit extreme view on the left. It could be a little more dense, um, but it shows that bare ground really good. If you were to have a pulp try to run away from something, they could navigate through that to where on the right side, they're gonna get stuck and easily caught. Um, so that's just kind of your benefits to native and then exotic. And we'll go a little bit into the forest side. So again, here's a closed canopy forest, like I stated. It's not the greatest picture, but you can see side by side, the sunlight actually getting to the forest floor on that open canopy, a thinned forest. So that creates good cover. And then uh, I wanna talk a little bit about woodlands. So again, I mentioned how they're good because of the native ground layer, but again, roosting trees, there's a lot of down debris in woodlands. 
which is really good for the nesting cover. It's not as great for, you know, foraging, but it's good escape cover for poults and hens. So woodlands are really great. Another thing I will mention that's not particularly about brood rearing, but the years that you burn these woodlands to maintain them can be excellent turkey hunting in the spring. Because these birds, these toms like to get out in the open and strut where they can be seen by hens and it just creates, it's a, it's really catch off because by the time the end of nesting season gets here, these herbaceous layers are really grown up and creates good nesting habitat too. So woodlands are a great thing. Um, so really I just was going to end with a little bit about the NWTF and what we do is we try to conserve wild, wild turkey, wild turkey habitat and preserve our hunting heritage. And the reason I throw that last part in there is a lot of people don't realize that hunters are one of the biggest donors to conservation and habitat work. So we just really try to push all that. And I appreciate you guys for having me on. Mm -hmm. I'll get off here once I figure out. <laughs> Boom. Okay, finally figured it out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. That was great. Um, next, I will be up, and I'm trying to figure it out myself here and get going. There we go. All right. So while I'm getting set up, I wanted to share this picture that has thousands of ducks piling into one of the wetland pools down at Swan Lake National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I worked there in the past. Um, where these pictures came from. And it's, it does a really good job of, job of showcasing just how many waterfowl and other game birds do come through Missouri. Um, and Swan Lake used to be the wild goose capital of the world, but as times change, uh, the Canada goose, geese that used to migrate there and use that as their wintering grounds have migrated further and further north actually. And they actually winter as far north as Minnesota now. But it's still a widely used um, uh, stopover site for migratory waterfowl and other migratory birds. Um, and anything else that requires wetland habitat, they, they love that area. Okay, so I also want to pick up where Tyler left off with the uh, hunting does fund conservation. Hunting is crucial for providing um, resources for conservation agents. Um, in Missouri, 576,000 people hunt and more than double that fish. So this is a billion dollar industry which brings money into the state and directly funds conservation through licenses that go um, towards supporting conservation and then sales tax and excise taxes on ammunition and fishing gear um, also contribute to conservation funding. In addition, many hunters are members of one of several of the conservation organizations such as our partners here in Pheasants Forever or Wild Turkey Federation. Um, and those directly implement habitat restoration. And I know as Dan and Ethan have hinted, we don't own any land as Merbo. So we rely on these guys to do quality habitat restoration and then we take a look at how well it's doing and try and promote how successful habitat restoration is. Um, Missouri is also fortunate to have a conservation department that is funded by a constitutionally permitted sales tax. And then every year we also, or every 10 years, there's also a bill that goes up for supporting the state parks and the DNR. And that is always overwhelmingly supported. So we're very fortunate in our conservation funding in our state and hunting is a big part of that. So now moving back from the waterfowl to the birds that I'm going to cover today, these are all illustrations from David Sibley um, as featured on Audubon's website. I'm going to talk about really small and I would say early season game birds. And these are the doves, woodcock, and snipe. So they're not super common game birds necessarily, but they're, they're really interesting too. Um, they're definitely smaller than the rest of the birds covered in the webinar, um, and as such, they can be incredibly hard to hunt, and they all present specific challenges that I'll get into when I'm talking about each specific species. Um, at the very bottom of the slide here, too, you'll see there's two more tiny illustrations of two rail species, which are technically game birds, but we won't cover them. They're secretive marsh birds, um, so they're not really well, they're not really commonly hunted, um, and all I'll say about them is yeah, they're not commonly hunted and can be easily confused with the non-game bird that is endangered in our state. So we don't want to really recommend hunting those. I'm going to go back to focusing on doves, snipes, and woodcock. So I'm going to start with um, the morning dove. So this is 
there's one of three different dove species. Uh, the morning dove is definitely the most abundant. Um, and they're actually the, one of the most hunted birds in North America, especially further south. Our season is so early because they do migrate further south over the course of the year. So we don't have them all year, but further south they'll be just constantly towards the, the wintering areas, they'll be hunting quite a bit more. So again, there are three species of doves. The morning doves are the first one, and I'm going to go a little bit more in detail for identifying specifically morning doves. You'll see they're this kind of dusky color, brown color with black spots um, on their wings. And then sometimes you can see a little black spot on the neck. It can also be useful for identification. Um, they live um, in most of the country year round, which is why they're very widely pursued. Um, and then some of the northern areas they do migrate out of. And I should clarify, a lot of them do migrate from our area, but there are still some residents that still live here, which is why they're listed as a resident or year round species. You won't see quite as many in the winter, but there are some that will definitely stick around, but a lot of them do migrate. Morning doves have a really low cooing sound is their song, and I'll play that here pretty quickly. So that was really short. Hopefully it came through. Did that go through? Okay. I saw nods from my, um, my other panelists. Um, it's, it's a good note that because it is so low, it may not pick up through computer speakers. So you can look it up on Xeno Canto, which is where we go for a lot of our bird sound recordings. You can look up the sound there. They're also pre probably pretty familiar with it. They are um, a species that regularly visits yards and feeders. Um, as such, they do visit feeders quite a bit because they pretty much eat seeds all year round. They don't switch to bugs to raise their young, which a lot of the native birds do. So these guys eat seeds and then they actually, in everything in the pigeon and dove family produces, it's called crop milk or pigeon milk, which is where they, they it's a different strategy. Again, it's, it's really nutritious, but I think it also is really expensive to make for the birds. So they typically have really small broods in their nests. They typically only have about two young at a time um, and they feed them this really nutritious um, crop milk. And actually I had a slideshow back at Swan Lake. It was like a flip board. It shows how quickly the, the baby doves develop. They, they mature out of the nest within about two weeks, which is crazy fast to think that they're, they're fully fledged that quickly. Um, they also use really small or kind of almost seems like lazy nests. They don't spend a lot of time building the nest, but any kind of depression or a little pile of sticks will be a nest for them. And they will produce more than one crop per year, or more than one brood per year, excuse me. Okay, the next most common dove in Missouri is the Eurasian collar dove. It is actually a non-native species, but it's very similar to the morning dove. Typically, in, it seems like they're typically a little bit lighter colored, kind of the slate gray, and they're usually a little bit larger in our area. And oftentimes you can see it, but not every time you can see this uh, semicircle black collar on the back of their necks. Um, they have similar habits to the morning dove where they eat seeds and they will visit frequent nests um, or frequent, frequent feeders. And then the last one I want to mention, which I think is really interesting, it is mentioned on the MDC guidelines for game birds, is the white winged dove. They've been a hot topic in my area because we've had a few presumed nesting pairs in my town, even though they're not typically a resident of Missouri. Um, you can see actually from their, their range map here, it doesn't look like they should normally be getting to Missouri at all, which I find is why it's really interesting that they are listed as one of the common game birds. Um, but their range has expanded over time and there are definitely are vagrants that'll spread further and further north. In fact, looking up some of the research, they go as far north as Canada too. Um, these guys are white winged doves because they have a, a um, very noticeable white wing patch. When the wings are folded up like this, it's white, like a white crescent on the very bottom of their wing. And then in flight, actually it's in the middle of their wing. So when you see them flying around, you'll see this big white wing bar in the middle, kind of like maybe a mockingbird. And they have that white wing wing patch in the middle. And then the next bird I'm going to go talking about is snipe hunting, which I found very funny when I first started working with Merbo. Um, I grew up in the Boy Scout 
uh, area. I grew up in Boy Scouts where we did learn that snipe hunting was a camp prank you would do where you'd you know, send somebody out in the woods with a bag in, in the middle of the night saying go snipe hunting. So when I got here and started learning my wetland birds and found out that this is actually a real bird, I got a really good kick out of that. Um, one other fun anecdote about snipe is the term sniper was coined by people who were able to successfully hunt these. Um, in the British colonies in India, there's another species of snipe. They termed somebody a sniper if they were able to, to actually bring these down because snipe fly in a zigzag pattern when really startled. When they fly up, when they flush up, they, they fly in a zigzag, which can be really challenging to shoot, especially if you're thinking colonial Britain, they didn't have more than one chance at them either. So he had to be a really good sniper to, to get snipe. All right, so now I'm gonna actually talk about the, the traits that the bird has. So you can see from the past slide and this slide that they are a true wetland bird. They forage in mud flats or shallow wetland areas, and they'll use this really long beak to probe in there and find any good seeds or invertebrates such as bugs or, or anything like that, or maybe even tadpoles, anything that they can basically fit that they'll eat in the mud flats, um, they, will, they will use. Um, these birds also have an elaborate courtship dance, which causes wing, wind to rush over their tail feathers in a very peculiar sound called a winnow. And if my audio plays back right, you should be able to hear it. Um, So it was that really fast kind of, it almost sounds like chirping or got a repeated, actually it sounds a lot like a screech owl, which I find really interesting because it's, it's just wind um, being directed over a couple of really pointed tail feathers. So that's not actually a vocalization at all. It's from their, their tail feathers during their, their flight. So it's really fascinating that it sounds like another bird's vocalization. Um, another thing about snipes is that they have been documented to live at least nine years old. Um, so they can live for a fairly long time for our birds. Um, let's see if there's anything else I had in my notes here quick. I think that's all I've got about the snipes. So I'm going to move on to my last bird, which is, oops, here we go, the American woodcock, which kind of looks similar to the snipe, but you'll see from my presentation that they're, they're different. Um, I think these are possibly the most goofy bird that we have and also adorable as a result. Um, so this is the American woodcock. You'll see these guys have their eyes really far back, set back in their head so they can observe uh, danger when they are foraging and they forage very similarly to the snipe. They'll have their heads down probing in the mud, but these guys are specialists typically on earthworms. So they'll specifically focus on earthworms when they're probing into the ground. They also have a couple of different names which sound appropriately goofy for the bird. Um, Timber Doodles one, Labrador Twister, Night Partridge, and Bog Sucker. But I'm gonna call them the Woodcock because that's the, the typical common name that we use in, in the bird world. But th they use their long bill to forage in mud as well. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight when I'm talking about how goofy they are is how goofy they sound. Uh, they have a really interesting call note and I'm gonna play it right here. So it was a really buzzy beep um, in, the, in that recording that is their call. You might have also picked up on there was a Canada goose honking in the very background. So it was the really buzzy thing that might sound more like a bug. That actually was the woodcock's call. Um, so this photo and the last photo do a really good job of showing their typical habitat. It's actually similar to what Tyler was talking about in the last part with the turkeys, where they prefer forest openings or forest edges. You can see a lot of the deciduous, um, the leaf litter here. Um, and looking at the leaf litter and looking at these guys and all the different browns and blacks, they look basically like the forest floor. So it's a really, really good camouflage for them. And it also harbors good earthworm populations. So it's good for their food too. 
So this is one of the easy, easier ways to actually differentiate these guys from the, the Wilson snipe because looking on the surface, you may have trouble differentiating between the two, but this is one of the perfect examples of where habitat is a wonderful way of identifying which bird species you're looking at. Um, and they also need forest openings. So like I said, they need some of that open area, that open forest to perform their elaborate dances, which also are quite spectacular. You generally don't see them, unfortunately, because they, they dance or they do their courtship dances in the either early evening, or I'm sorry, the late evening or early dawn. And they'll fly up really high and do circles and make some also weird sounds, but I couldn't find a great recording of it, so I don't have it here. Um, these dances also were a favorite of Aldo Leopold's, who was one of the fathers of conservation and also was a hunter, um, which caused him to draw attention to the fact that game birds not just only belong on a plate. In our area, woodcocks are typically migrants and they typically live in Missouri during the breeding season and then winter further south. But sometimes uh, it's been noted in mild years that they will stay further north in this range. So if we have a mild winter, you might see them around too. But that is all I've got. And I will pass it off to Ethan. Can y'all hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. So yeah, my name is Ethan Claycamp. I'm a Quail Forever Farm Bill wildlife biologist. Um, I cover a three county area in Northwest Missouri. And so a big thanks to folks at MRBO to invite me out um, to talk about what I think is undeniably the most charismatic of Missouri's game birds. And they might not be as adorable as the woodcock or generate as much um, hunting excitement or, or revenue as turkey or ducks, but um, they got charisma in spades. And so um, I'm gonna try to run through this really quick. There's a lot to talk about with, with these birds. And so um, hopefully you're left with still a lot of questions and some excitement. And so I put the link to our, um, our Missouri PFQF website up there. So check us out, um, hook up with one of our biologists if you have some more questions. And so a little bit about what we do. Dana had mentioned um, our tagline is the habitat organization. And so we are, composed of a lot of hunters, but rather than being, you know, um, a foremost hunting advocacy group, really a habitat advocacy group. Um, and, and actually, like Dana said, we do a lot of the work ourselves. Um, in some parts of the country, we actually do acquire land um, through purchases. Um, we'll restore it and turn it over to public ownership. And that's something you might be hearing about soon in Missouri that we just started doing. Um, and so that's, that's an exciting thing. But most of the stuff we do, we work on private land. Um, and as, as my title suggests, Farm Bill Biologist, um, I work with CRP, with EQIP, CSP, and some of these programs that MRBO is going to be talking about in a couple weeks um, to make sure that good quail and pheasant um, and just good grassland habitat is going on the ground. Um, Kind of our other second half of our mission is youth outreach and education. And so we do a lot of youth pollinator plots, um, a lot of learn to hunt events. Um, and just now we're expanding into um, women on the wing events, lots of really great outreach we do. And so our mission birds, the, um, the two birds that we kind of use to galvanize our, our base are the Northern Bob White and the Ringneck Pheasant. And that's the Colinus virginianus, which is the Virginia quail and Phasianus colchicus uh, being the ringneck pheasant. And looking at their North American distributions, you can see that the bobwhite quail is really a southeastern bird, whereas ringneck pheasant really are a grassland bird in, in those northern climes. Uh, I'll mention that uh, this is something that uh, Ethan Duke was ribbing me about on our practice call yesterday, and I have to agree with him. Uh, the, the ringneck voyager, the Ringneck pheasant is a non-native bird, and a lot of people don't realize that because it has been around for so long. In fact, this species have, has been trucked and carted and shipped around since the, the 1,000, so, so th over 1,000 years ago, and in America since before the revolution. And they're really, I consider them the trout of the bird world, and so they're, they're moved around a lot, for, mainly for sport, and we can really utilize the excitement that they generate um, to generate revenue for conservation efforts to, to act as uh, a means of educating the public. But because they're non-native and because we fly the quail flag here in Missouri, 
Um, this bird is flying right out of this presentation. So we're going to focus on Bob White. And what you may not know, there are actually four species of so-called Bob White, and that's the Colinus genus. And you see on this range map here that uh, we just have the northern Bob White, and we only have one subspecies in Missouri. But if you include the rest of the southeast down into the Yucatan Peninsula, there are actually 22 species of northern Bob White. And you can see some of the variation in their plumage. And so it's, it's pretty diverse group, really New World quail. This doesn't even show the four or five species of Western quail that we have. And as an organization, we have biologists positioned out there who are, who are working a lot with scaled quail and uh, California quail and, and all across the map. And so when you consider a little bit about the ecology or the life history needs of, of these birds, um, I'll, you can start anywhere on this circle. I'll, I'll jump in where we're at right now, which is still kind of peak breeding season. And you can see from really April through October, um, they're dedicating all their time to finding a mate, to nesting, to raising a brood. And what all of us biologists hope for is they'll pull off a successful clutch and go back and re-nest. And, and so that adds to their really great reproductive potential to have the ability to, to nest multiple times in the year. And then the coveys, which if you haven't seen yourself, um, it's quite a sight to step on one and have them blow up in your face. It's something you'll never forget, but you've certainly seen it in artwork. So these are the, the little rings of birds that are huddling together for warmth and for protection. From predators, you know, part of that covey explosion is to disorient predators. And so they'll stay in that covey state for many months of the winter, and then they'll start breaking up and, and looking for, for mates again late March and, and early April. And so starting with um, what it's it's often debated, you know, what's the most important part of the year for quail? Is it the nesting and brood rearing or is it winter survival? And I think it's kind of a pointless argument because it all really matters. It's all important. Um, I'm just starting by chance on nesting and brood rearing. And so uh, it takes about five days to build a nest. Egg laying is one, uh, one egg a day up to 12 or 15 eggs in a clutch. And then much like you saw with Tyler's slide about the wild turkey, it's quite a long incubation period. And so this is when those hens are most vulnerable when they're sitting put on those nests. And not only vulnerable to nest predators like snakes and skunks and raccoons, but mowing kills so many of these birds. And so um, if you go back to that season we're talking about, a lot of times, or at least historically, we would say, try to not mow or try to rest these grasslands May 1st through July 15th. And that really underestimates the amount of time those birds need to to really um, build their populations up because this is a boom or bust species and so they need a ton of that um, growing season and so we might you know feel good if we if we say well we waited until July 15th but chances are there's still a lot of mortality associated with mowing later in the season like that. Um, I reference here are selected and so that's kind of a fancy ecological term uh, on a spectrum are selected to case selected and that's giving you an idea of what kind of parental input they have and how that relates to, excuse me, the number of, of offspring they have. And so um, these would be on the R end of the spectrum, high reproductive potential, low parental input. And so when these um, chicks are being hatched, they're pretty precocial. They're ready to go get up and walk around and they're not getting a whole lot of parental attention. And so that helps uh, you know, free up time for, for the adults to go back and, and re-nest. Um, something kind of on the other end of that spectrum might be like a white-tailed deer that'll have one or two offspring a year and will stick with them through, through quite a period of time. Um, much like Tyler talked about with his turkey poults, really these birds are eating almost exclusively insects for the first six to eight weeks of life. And they need that to meet that high protein demand because they go through incredible growth. I think by 14 or 16 weeks, they're almost full size bird. And the habitat that they really need to, that bugging habitat, I'll reiterate what Tyler said, uh, is an overhead canopy of weeds. Um, and it allows them to be shaded out from aerial predators. It allows them to maneuver through that habitat. And really importantly, it allows them to stay dry because for the first at least two weeks of life, 
these birds can't thermoregulate. And so being able to stay dry is really, really important. Uh, if you have like a dense sod bound field full of fescue or brome, if it gets any dew on it or any rain and them kind of trying to make their way through habitat like that, uh, they could easily succumb to just to that hypothermia essentially. And so the bare ground is a must. Uh, and you hear us quail biologists talk about that all the time. And this is kind of giving you an idea of what, you know, a larger view of what this nesting and brood rearing habitat looks like. It's really all one and the same. We used to plant blocks of grass next to blocks of annual weeds and forbs, but um, we found that the less distance that a hen or a rooster needs to travel with the young to get into their bugging grounds, the, the better off they're going to be. So that's really all intermingled. Um, the other really, you know, huge habitat component, and I'm going to lump some of them together just into escape cover. Um, and, and often it's woody cover when we're talking about escape cover, and they need to be protected from the elements, first and foremost, I'd say, the, the winter ice and snow, the heat in the summer, um, and then predators. And so the ability to kind of get into a, a kind of a cage of woody stems to escape from hawks and foxes and what all have you, um, and then still being able to get back up out of there if they need to. Uh, and this is what that would look like. I know this is a um, summertime picture and some of those, those leaves are gonna be lost in the winter time, but hopefully there would still be enough grasses and branches to kind of keep the snow up off the ground. But what I think this picture really does a great job of showing is the proximity of these different kind of what we call them as covey headquarters. And so research has shown that these birds really don't like to travel more than 75 or 100 feet from this really good woody cover in the winter time. And so when we're managing land or helping people come up with strategies for managing their land, we really like to have these scattered out, not too terribly far apart to allow quail to access more of the field. And so given that you could see that you know, it's quite a wide range of early successional habitat that these birds really rely on. Um, you can see I have the quail circled there. And this kind of shows not only, you know, a field edge, but this shows um, temporal succession from a disturbed soil community to annual weeds, perennial weeds, grass and shrub. And they really need kind of all of that and really in close proximity to fulfill their, their life history requirements. And in the wild, in the you know, natural environments where you'd find these birds would include woodlands, glades, savanna, and prairie habitat. And so they're by no means a prairie obligate species, but since that's where you really find their densest populations in the state now, and because I work in a prairie region, I'm gonna kind of focus the next few slides on prairie. And so his, historically, you can see there in, in those darker shaded areas on the map, um, prairie in, in Missouri exceeded 15 million acres. And this really evolved in the last 10 or 12,000 years since the last glaciation period. Um, and this was, you know, typified by, you know, this was tall grass prairie region. And so six or seven foot tall native warm season grasses, really tremendous diversity of, of native forbs and legumes and just a really incredible um, speciose environment. And so in order to maintain it as prairie, it needed periodic disturbance. And so uh, stuff like wildfire and native grazing was really important. And so this really diverse, really healthy ecosystem had really awesome soil underlying it. And so which led to the ultimate, you know, we won't say full demise yet, but it led to this conversion. And so, you know, you might think, oh, this was the beginning of the end for quail, but that's not the case at all. And so some of this early agricultural development resulted in a real quail haven, actually. And so managed hedgerows that were being, you know, firewood cut out of them, fence posts cut out of them, lots of bare ground from tillage, really weedy fields. This was pre-Roundup ready crops, um, waste grains galore. I think it wasn't until maybe the 1970s that harvest efficiency surpassed 75 percent and so you had just kind of a really artificial landscape that they benefited from and then things really started to change kind of mid 20th century where you started seeing things like this which is just absolute monoculture um, transition from native forages to fescue another monoculture 
of course our yards are monoculture and so this great simplification if you will is really what led to this fall that we're seeing right now and this is the slide that we're trying to trying to stabilize in reverse um, i think it's something like 60 or 70 percent of the historic quail population in missouri has been lost in the last 30 or 40 years and it's not quail alone it's it's all kinds of grassland birds and so this was something that I would think a lot of the folks viewing might have encountered last year. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology had sent this really big study out that got a lot of publicity. And among those birds that are really suffering, the grassland birds have had some of the steepest declines. And so we're really missing things like dick sisal, bobolink, uh, meadowlark, shrikes, field sparrows, prairie chickens. Um, that were at one time or now just in you know small patches are they ubiquitous. Um, and so we realized this, you know, 15 or 20 years ago that we couldn't simply be a hunting cover organization. We couldn't simply do food plots and, and plum thickets to bring back what we needed. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through some of this stuff pretty quick. So diverse habitat is really where the answer lies. And so we do that through a variety of means. Um, through brand new reseedings is something we do through like the CRP program or some of the other cost share programs where we're planting 20, 30, 40 species of native wildflower in a mix and through management. So that woody cover component we get really quickly by doing what's called edge feathering, which you see on the left there, where you're just felling trees strategically along the field edge to get that really good um, dense woody cover. Prescribed fire is something that we work with a ton, you know, and you can time it different times a year to achieve what you want. Um, and, and really set back the grass, even native grass on its own isn't great quail habitat. Um, and so trying to stimulate as many forbs and as much diversity as we can. Um, we do this on idle land. We do this on working lands. So MRBO knows a lot about the um, conservation grazing work that's going on with Audubon. And so promoting native forages on pastures is something we do. Um, and the really cool thing about working with quail as this umbrella species, you know, we're harnessing the excitement around quail to really have the benefit for all of these species. And so the grassland birds are starting to thrive in the places where we're devoting a lot of work. Pollinators thrive. I talk about monarchs and, and honeybees more than I talk about quail in my day to day. And so that's kind of an added benefit. The atmosphere thrives. This is really exciting. The root systems on these prairie plants that we work with are just so so immense and they have so many um, fungal associations in the soil they're putting so much carbon in the ground which we desperately need right now um, and linked closely to that is water infiltration and filtration so water thrives and i'll end this on kind of a sappy note i'll say our communities thrive too um, these places our chapters that are really most successful are really engaging youth in their community. This was a picture in Columbia where these kids, if, if you check out A.L. Gustin Golf Course, they've been planting, um, restoring prairie habitat on that golf course for years now. And so it's really awesome to work with a species that has such an impact beyond just its own, uh, its own self. So with that, um, I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but we'll take some questions. Um, and so I'll bounce it back to the gallery view. All right. All right. Thanks so much. That was a really good wrap up too. Uh, putting it all together. Um, we have a question in the Q and A. Um, it's from someone that we at MRBO know. Um, it's actually our field crew leader, Eric who is down in El Dorado Springs doing nesting studies on Taborville and Wakantica prairies down there. Um, and what you mentioned, Ethan Kay, about paying. So our, our uh, nesting study project has definitely found that the other grassland birds that you mentioned um, are nesting a lot, whether, you know, sick, second broods typically, but they're nesting a lot later in the season than was previously thought. Yeah. So, um, Eric just said this morning that they found eight nests today and it's July 14th. So wow. um, important for everything um, to, if people can go a lot later than that, 
previously well thought of July 15th. Um, right. Yeah. And if you, if you can't do a complete rest, um, trying to be responsible with your mowing, leaving some patches. And I know there are things, you know, adornments on your haying equipment that you can, you can use like flushing bars and even the, the path that you take when you mow, it might seem trivial or insignificant, but you know, it comes at a great cost if you, if you don't at least try to um, save a little room for, for these species. Uh, Eric asks, it seems like this summer has been a really good year for quail in southwestern Missouri where he's working. Has Ethan heard anything similar up there in northwest Missouri? How's I haven't seen any of the data um, synthesized yet. Um, anecdotally, I, I would say it's it's been pretty good. Um, I know last spring was kind of our silent spring following such a harsh icy winter that we had. Uh, I know that was the case in my house at least where the covey that hangs out there went from 20 down to three just from the ice. And so um, it seems, yeah, really, but it's linked to the places where, where we've done good habitat work. And so I know you guys are probably involved with some of the focus area monitoring, um, but I think, yeah, it's been a pretty good spring where I'm at, um, but I don't have any figures that I could share with you yet, but I'm glad to hear things are looking good down there. Mm -hmm. Um, our next question is from Rockney, um, and he says, thank you for the presentation on grassland birds. I will be converting around 30 acres of beans to native grasslands. Woohoo! Well Later done. Here, um, on a plot of land east of Kirksville, do you have any resources you can help, <laughs> you can share to help me with this process? And I bet you do. <laughs> is, are you, do you, would you like me to field that? Yes, please. please. Okay. Um, well, and I guess I'll plug your guys' um, webinar that's coming up. Is that two or three weeks from now, you guys will be talking about conservation that's programs? Three weeks, and we hope you'll be joining us. It's going to be um, Tuesday, August 4th at 5.30 p.m. It's just it's habitat restoration for birds. Everything you always wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I won't, I won't, you know, get too deep into it, but there, there are tons of opportunities and even more so when it comes to converting row crop like that. And so assuming you, you know, it hasn't just been in row crop for a year or two, um, it likely has the crop history to be eligible for the conservation reserve program, which is um, either, you know, 10 or 15 year contract and you could receive annual payments for converting that to um, perennial vegetation. And so there's a whole list of practices you can do through CRP. Um, you could even plant trees if you wanted to, but uh, we really push what's called CP38, which is kind of the deluxe quail package. And so that would have high diversity of forbs and native grasses, some woody cover either through shrub plantings or edge feathering, and then um, 10 to 20 percent of it would go into, into food plots. And so if you don't want to have that intensive of management, there are all kinds of practices and pollinator focused practices, but um, yeah, you have a lot of options. Um, and like I said, you could check us out at uh, MissouriPFQF.org and find a biologist in your area. I don't know if we have one assigned to Adair County, if that's where you're at, um, but we have, have biologists right in that area who would be more than happy to meet you on your farm uh, and talk you through some of those options. Uh, but good for you. That's great to hear people wanting to, to put the work in like that. That's a really exciting thing to hear about. You know, when, when you go to convert a piece of land, whether it's 100 acres, 30 acres, 5 acres, it's exciting to see the changes that take place. And it doesn't all happen the first year. And some of the things you might plant might pop up seven, eight years later, but every season's different then. It's not just going from one season to the next and sort of the, seeing the same things every year. Um, and you can see immediately the invertebrate benefits and then the subsequent wildlife kind of more megafauna um, benefits. It's a, it's a really exciting thing to see happen on the landscape.
see. I'm not seeing any more questions. Does anybody have any more questions before we finish? I know we're a little over, but that's just because this is a big topic. And I know that the guys that presented just scratched the surface. So, um, Dana, would you like me to address the one that came in um, before? Oh, no. That would be great. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we had a question come in yesterday, I believe. It was asking about if there was any relationship between um, some of the decline in quail numbers, and how they might be associated with the rise in chipmunk numbers, because um, there have been studies and reports of um, nest predation on quail by chipmunks. And that was actually the first that I had heard of that. And I, I didn't have time today to look at the research, but um, the two big things that I would want to say are um, every species is an opportunist. And so there are stories of deer eating baby ducks. Um, there are, you know, stories. Yeah, I've, I hear pretty much weekly stories of, of uh, turkey eating quail quail chicks. And so I, I wouldn't dismiss that, dismiss that as, as false, but um, none of these other species are actually hunting quail specifically. And so, yeah, if you have a, a chick the size of your thumb or the size of a bumblebee that wanders in, in front of a, of a feeding turkey, that might look like a grasshopper. So yeah, I could see that happening. Um, but as far as, you know, nest predators, I wouldn't put chipmunks high on the list for quail. I'd say black, black rat snakes are way up there. Um, skunks and raccoons. Raccoons, you know, have quadrupled their population in the last 30 years in Missouri. Um, I don't talk about predators that much because we strongly believe that habitat is the key. Um, but yeah, predators are definitely a part of that, of that equation. Um, but I know you guys, um, Dana and Ethan had shared that you had chipmunks um, getting a hold of birds that you were misnetting, I believe. And that, that was fascinating to hear. Uh, I, I was unaware of that. Um, but I would say, I would think the rise of the chipmunk and the decline of the quail is more linked to habitat and that it's shifted to a, a habitat type that was more um, beneficial for chipmunks to, um, to increase, especially as, um, as prairies were encroached by, by woodies. Um, and so that was an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting question. Just to correct it, I, we didn't have chipmunks because we don't have chipmunks around where we, we banned, where we had uh, uh, somebody that we we're communicating with has seen that. And I've also seen other people doing nest studies, seeing a lot of predation of eggs with uh, chipmunks. Um, I'm glad you guys kept it civil when it came to turkeys predating quail. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, another aspect that I'll add in that I've learned from our amazing quail biologists and, and because we're out there in that grassland community so much about the predation. So along with the, all the Leopold philosophy of don't blame the predator, um, there's also the, the backing up what you said about the habitat and that these traditionally very open prairie landscapes have gotten wooded corridors now that facilitate the raccoons being able to reach out in prairie areas where they historically weren't able to get into. So yeah. uh, it's a complex game, but it, we're, we're figuring those things out. Yeah, I wish I, I could have included some of that um, tracking data because that, yeah, it's really eye-opening to see the overlap of where raccoons can and can't get to in different landscapes and where the quail want to nest, but uh, yes, habitat. I'm, uh, I'm about to put in the chat, um, the, or actually Ethan and Tyler, if you guys would, the question was, for your contact info or, you know, potentially um, by all, you know, I know that you have colleagues that are working in different parts of the state. So whatever maybe the best um, web links are for that, I was just gonna kind of look at both of your websites and kind of find yeah. the Yeah, if you wouldn't mind putting again, missouripfqf.org. Um, there's like a staff locator map in there and 
and don't think we're we're only you know strictly prohibited from leaving our core areas i think you know i'm i have three main counties but i've probably done work in six or seven counties around here and so someone at the very least would be able to talk with you on the phone or through email um, and would very much you know, likely be able to get out on your farm with you. And all of that consultation is completely free of charge. And if you end up wanting to go through a program, uh, we'll be trying to give you money to do these things. So we are the ultimate good guys. You know, we, we don't ask for much, just uh, for you to do some good work on your farms. I don't know about ultimate good guys. No, okay, yeah. <laughs> I also don't know about together. charismatic <laughs> species. A little whistling bob coming up. Oh my goodness. What? Yeah. That's so charismatic. <laughs> but yeah, I'll add my contact info to the chat too. I'm going to go will, ahead and wait for we will, Sorry, we, will also, we will also be posting that information over the YouTube video that subsequently gets posted. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Dana put in the chat, our upcoming webinar advertisement will be posted soon. I just want to air it on the recording too. check our website and we'll have that advertised and it'll be on our social media and everything too. We've got another slate of Webinars coming up. We'll have another, I think, a six-part series, so we'll just keep them going. Um, next Tuesday, we're going to take off, but after that, we'll be back every Tuesday at the same time. So stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Tyler and Ethan, for joining us. Really, thanks really. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, we'll talk to you soon, hopefully. All right. You guys have a good one.